So, as I was saying, in our last lecture, I discussed about the division of the nervous system. So, where I discussed the division of the nervous system to be basically into two parts, what we call the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And I also made mention that the central nervous system is made up of three basic things, what I call the brain, the brain stem, and the spinal cord. And so, the brain itself is being encased inside the cranium. You know, the cranium is contained inside the skull. So, the brain stem, as I told you before, is part of the larger brain. And this brain stem is in relation to one big foramen at the base of the skull itself. So, if it is just the human body, and this is the skull here. So the whole of the central part of the central nervous system, if this is the brain here encased in the skull within the cranium, so the brain stem, part of the brain stem, you know, is in relation to one big foramen here, what is called foramen magnum. So the foramen magnum serves as a foramen through which part of the brain passes through it into the vertebral canal. And the vertebral canal, I'm sure you are aware that the vertebral canal is formed by 31 vertebral bones. So we have what we call vertebral bones. This vertebral bones, we have seven cervical, we have 12 thoracic, we have five lumbar, we have five sacral, and then we have one to two or even three coccygeal bones. So this makes the entire vertebral bones together, and then in each of these vertebral bones, there's a foramen in the midline, what we call vertebral foramen, since each one of them is just like a stack of coin. When you join the vertebral bones together, the foramen or the foramen of each of the vertebral bones, they now form a canal. And that is what we call vertebral canal. So vertebral canal is mainly formed by the stacking of the vertebral foramen so that the spinal cord passes through this canal. So it means that the spinal cord is being enclosed by the vertebral bones together by forming the vertebral canal. Are you all clear? Good. So we now know that the brain is being encased inside the cranium and the spinal cord is being encased by the vertebral bones, the 31, 32, or 33 pieces of vertebral bones. So we have seen that. So in general, the nervous system or the nervous tissue consists of two major cells. The most important among them is what we call the neuron. And a neuron is what we call or define as the structural and functional unit of a nervous system or of a nervous tissue. We say that neuron is a structural and functional unit of a nervous tissue. Apart from the neuron, we also have what we call neuroglial cells. These neuroglial cells, they are the connective, connective tissues around the neurons. It's just like what we are. If not because of your parents and your relatives, and your friends, probably most of you will not have been here to study MBBS or to study anything. Why? Because you may not likely have any support. So your parents and your colleagues and your brothers and sisters, they do give you support. Either financial support, moral support, you get it, and so on and so forth. And that is why you are here. So the same thing here, the neurons are being supported by neuroglial cells. 
what are the support that they give to the neurons? They give them nutrition, nutrients, for them to be able to perform their own fun function. Are you clear? So the neuroglial cells, we said, they are connective tissue. Apart from giving them nutrients, they also bring them together. They bind them together, you know, just like a very good mother that brings her children towards her. You get it? For them, for the kids to have, you know, a motherly, you know, uh, enjoyment, whatever. So now we've seen that there are two major types of cells in the nervous system, and the neurons and the neuroglial cells, they are in billions in our human body, in, 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 the, in the nervous system. It is roughly the neurons, the number of the neurons in the nervous system is about 86 billion in our own body. 86 billion, not a million. 86 billion neurons in our own brain and other part of the nervous system. Similarly, the neuroglial cells are a little bit lower in number than the uh, uh, neurons itself. So this one is about 85 billion in number. So you can see that by the time you combine the 86 and 85 billion, you, you know we have over 160 billion cells in our nervous system. You can imagine how many billions of cells you know, that we are made up of. You get my point? So, because we are multicellular kind of organisms, so billions or trillions of cells, you know, are the ones that contribute to our formation. So here we have about 171 billion type of neural cells, both the neurons and the neurogaia cells. If you can remember in the last video, I also discussed about the gray matter and the white matter of the nervous system. So there are differences between the gray matter and the white matter within the brain and also within or without the spinal cord. The thing is that, if you can remember very well, last time when I was discussing about, you know, the cerebral cortex, I said that cerebral cortex is just like a coating, you know, of the cell bodies around the brain. So the gray matter in the cerebral hemispheres, you know, is outside. Well, when you cut deep inside the cerebral hemisphere, you will only see the white matter. That means the bundles of axons of these neurons that caught the periphery of the cerebral hemisphere. So the gray matter of the cerebral hemisphere is outside. While the gray matter of the spinal cord, if you now take a cross section of the spinal cord, if this is the spinal cord here, you take a cross section here, you take, you look at it from above, then you are going to see something like this. If this is just a cross section of the spinal cord here, so we are going to see that the gray matter is inside and it is in form of figure H shape. You get it? So you have the gray matter component of the spinal cord inside and the white matter outside. While for the brain, the white matter is inside and the gray matter is outside. And I, I also told you that, apart from the gray matter, you know, the cortex, you know, is it, the same thing with the cerebellum. Cerebellum also has its own gray matter outside and the white matter inside, because that is a small brain. If you can remember, I said that cerebellum is our small brain. So the same is similar, the arrangement of the gray matter and the white matter is similar to that of the larger, brain. that is the cerebral hemisphere itself. So, uh, uh, if you look, if you can remember, I also said that apart from this coating of the gray matter outside with regard to the cerebral hemisphere and the cerebellar hemispheres and inside for the spinal cord, we also have some aggregation of cell bodies within the white matter of either the cerebellum or the cerebral hemisphere. You get my point. So those aggregations of the cell bodies within the cerebral hemisphere or the cerebella is what we call nucleus, which I have already discussed before. You get it? And if, it is, if this is the aggregation, if this aggregation occurs outside the central nervous system, like in the dorsal root ganglia that we said before, that is what we call a ganglion. You understand? So aggregation of cell bodies within central nervous system is what we call a nucleus. If the aggregation is outside the central nervous system, that is what we call a ganglion. 
plural ganglia are you clear so apart from this name ganglion with regard to the nervous system you may come across certain terms similar to this ganglion but then they have different names you get it i'm sure as you go to america you, know, you will hear a lot of things you know like the ganglions you know that may appear in the in the hand you know those of the hand or maybe elsewhere in their own body it may be six cystic that means it's fluctuant that one too is called ganglion so you may get some terminology similar to this but they are not having the same meaning even though they are of the same spelling and what have you so now we've seen the differences between the nucleus and the ganglion similarly the white matter bundles that we discussed before both the descending and the ascending fibers that i discussed before so the aggregation of the white matter or the aggregation of the axons within the central nervous system is what we call a tract if these bundles of axons they bundle together and they go they originate from different areas within the brain or the cerebellum or wherever and then they join together to go to the same place and perform the same function that is what we call a tract but if these bundles of y uh, axons they get out of the central nervous system that means they are out of the brain the cerebellum or out of the spinal cord then they are called nerve so that means all these nerves that you have read you during your all level 200 your median nerve your ulnar nerve your musculoskeletal whatever kind of nerve all these are bundles of axons you get my point coming from inside the spinal cord and so there are bundles of axons of nerves coming out from the spinal cord so they are called nerve and so if these axons the bundles of these axons are inside the spinal cord or the cerebral hemisphere or the cerebellum they are called tract so we have now known the differences between a ganglion a nucleus a tract and a nerve so we have seen this so as i told you before the structural and functional unit of a nervous system or nervous tissue is a neuron and if you can remember during the last lecture i said that neuron looks like a human being you get my point it has a head and then it has a body you get my point the only thing is that it doesn't have limbs but then we can say it has limbs in the end just like our lower limb you get my point so now we've seen that this head of a neuron is what we call cell body so the entire this the entire aspect of this is what we call cell body while the remaining aspect is what we call the axon so the cell body itself the the cell body is similar to any other cell in the human body but then there are peculiarities with regard to the cell body or the head of a neuron so this cell is particularly different from other cells even though almost most of what our normal cells do have this cell body or this cell also have this component so the cell membrane of this neuron is polygonal that means it has several sides when we say something is bigonal that means it has, it has only two sides triangle three sides polygonal multiple sides like square and rectangle they are all multi you know uh, uh, polygonal so the cell membrane that surrounds the cell body itself is polygonal that means it has multiple you know uh, sides and on the head you know not all neurons have this but most of the neurons have these processes so on the head there may be so it may be plus or minus processes on the head what did i say i said that on the cell body of a neuron you may have or may not have what you call processes these processes may be one or more are you clear all these are the questions that i used to ask in my mcq you can say you have to listen attentively to what i'm saying i that is why i'm all, always saying things with emphasis so that you people don't forget so i said on the cell membrane of this cell body 
you may have one or more processes. You may even have none on. So I said you may have or may not have processes on the cell body. You may, if you have, then you may have only one or you may have many. Are you clear? Good. So these processes on the head, they are called dendrites. Are you clear? So the processes on the head or on the cell body of a neuron is what we call dendrites. There is also one large process, what you call the axon or the body of the neuron. So it means that a neuron may have one or more processes. And these processes, one of them is unbranched. And if it has more than one, they may be branched. So these processes on the cell body, they are all branching processes. So that means the dendrites, they branch a rebranch. So the dendrites, they are processes which are branching. So they may branch a rebranch a rebranch. You get it? So these are dendrites on the head. The, cell, the, the, the dendrites themselves, this, the cytoplasm of the cell body extends into each of the dendrites. And in the cytoplasm, there is a centrally placed nucleus. This nucleus is pale when you look at it under microscope. I said what? It is pale in nature. So this, the nucleus is large and pale and is centrally located. And it has one or more nucleoli. So it may have one nucleolus or may have several nucleoli inside the nucleus itself. Are you all clear? Good. So we now know that the nucleus is centrally placed, is pale when you look at it under a microscope, and it is, uh, it is having one or more nucleoli within it, and it is surrounded by the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm consists of a lot of bisophilic structures in there. You get my point. So in the cytoplasm, we have virtually all the intracellular organs that we have in other cells. Like so we have the endoplasmic reticulum, both rough and smooth, endoplasmic reticulum. And then we also have Golgi apparatus, which I have already written here. And you also have the ribosomes. We also have some lysosomes and what have you. So most of these intracellular organs, we also see them inside the uh, cytoplasm of the cell body of a neuron. What is so peculiar about the cell body or the cell of a neuron is that, apart from it having the polygonal cell membrane and having processes on the cell membrane, it has what you call nissel granules. These nissel granules, they are nothing but the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You know, the endoplasmic reticulum, they are there for the production and you know, assembling of the proteins in our cells. So this rough endoplasmic reticulum, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cytoplasm of the neuron, they are called nissel granules. So the nissel granules, they don't extend into the axon. That means they only stay within the periphery of, or within the perimeter of the cell body. So the cell body, you understand, the cell body, you know, ends at a place what we call axon hillock. That is the neck of the neuron itself. So there is what we call axon hillock, which attaches the cell body with the body of the neuron, that is the axon itself. So the nissel bodies or nissel granules, they don't extend into the hillock. So that means the axon 
the cytoplasm of the axon and the cytoplasm of the axon, axon hillock, they are deficient of the nasal granules. The axon ends or terminates at what we call terminal buttons. These terminal buttons are the limbs of the neurons, just, just like our lower limbs. So it is these terminal buttons that attach with other neurons to make a synapse so that any information that comes from this neuron, it is going to be transmitted to another neuron here. This button will also pass information to another neuron. Another neuron will come here and then the information will pass like that. And so these terminal buttons, they serve as limbs for transmitting impulses, the action potential that is being generated from that cell, and then it will just be, you know, transported or transmitted along, you know, the terminal buttons towards the synaptic junction. Because the junction between the terminal button of one neuron and the cell body or dendrites of another neuron, that junction is what you call a synaptic junction or a synapse. You get my point. So now we've seen this. So a neuron may be myelinated or unmyelinated, which we'll discuss later on. Now we've seen the structure of a neuron. So what are the different types of a neuron? You see, neurons just like we people, we are different. Some among us, they are tall, some they are short, some are light in complexion, some are dark. You get my point? So that is similar to the, and some are very heavy, and some are very asthenic like myself. You get my point? So it's like the neurons, they're also the same. So they also differ from one another. So the neurons can be divided or can be classified based on the number of processes they do have. If you can remember my last testament, I said they may or may not have a process in the cell body, but then at least each neuron must have a process. Do you see another term again? I said at least a neuron must have a process. That means even if it is only one, that neuron will have it. So no neuron without any process. Are you clear? Good. So we said that neuron can be classified based on the number of processes. Based on the number of processes, there is what we call unipolar neuron. That means that neuron has only one process emanating from only one pole. For example, if this is a ball, or just like an earth, this is what we call North Pole, South Pole, right? East and West Pole. You get my point? The same thing. So if you look at this, just like round, you get it? So at one pole or at one end, maybe North Pole here, you may have one process here. So that process, which is this one here, so you can see that this neuron, a process emanates from it. And that is what we call unipolar neuron. In some of your textbook, it is also called pseudo unipolar neuron. Are you clear? Good. Ideally, the neuron is supposed to look like this. Only one process like that. But then you have something like this. Just like our dorsal root ganglion. Dorsal root ganglion is just like this one. Pseudo unipolar kind of neuron. So there's also what we call bipolar. That means from two ends. From probably North Pole or South Pole or from East Pole or West Pole. Something like that. Some, something like that. So you have a neuron with a cell body in the center. And then you have one small process from the head and then you have very long one serving at the axon. And that is what we call bipolar kind of neuron. You get it? And so this bipolar kind of neuron, we can have it in our own 
ES in the retina, you can have bipolar kind of bipolar cells in the retina. And then the other one is what you call multipolar. That means from all the poles, maybe from the west pole, east pole, north pole, south pole, from northwest, you know, northeast, you get it east, uh, southeast, you get it southwest, all the poles. So these dendrites, you can see dendrites coming from all other angles. And then there is another long one, the axon. Are you clear? And that's what you call multipolar kind of neuron. And this kind of neuron, we have it in the, uh, in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, which we'll discuss later on. So there is reason for all this number of processes on which a neuron has. The more the number of the processes, the more the amount of information that can be passed. I don't know that you understand my point clear. The neuron that has many processes, that means it is likely going to receive more inputs from various places. Just like somebody who is born from a very, you know, large family. You know, he has, you know, a father, a mother, grandparents, all of them are alive. He has about 30 or 40 siblings. You get it? So maybe he's the last one in the house. You see, everybody in the house will be contributing towards his education at the end. And then that boy, no matter if he wants to go abroad and study, he can easily go because he has so many supports from everybody in the house. So the same thing with this multipolar kind of neurons, because it has many processes, so it has several information coming towards it. You get my point? So now we've seen that neuron can be classified based on the number of processes. Based on the number of functions, based on the function they perform, the neuron can be divided into, or can be classified into association kind of neurons and commissional kind of neurons. If you can remember last lecture, I said that neurons can connect with other neurons closer to them. Why we said short association fibers and long association fibers. If axon of one neuron now continues in a long distance to meet another neuron, for example, within the cerebral hemisphere. And so these association neurons, you know, they connect one area with, they connect to one, one neuron connects with another neuron within the same cerebral hemisphere. The commercial kind of neurons is like one neuron from one cerebral hemisphere connects with another neuron in the other cerebral hemisphere. So those neurons from the right, left side, they connect with the other neurons of the right side, and so they cross the midline. And that is what we call the commercial kind of neurons. So based on function, neurons can be classified either association neurons or commercial neurons. Based on the shape, they can also be classified into what we call pyramidal kind of neuron. Pyramidal is just like a pyramid. That means it's triangular in shape. So that means pyramidal kind of neurons they are triangular. So the cell body is triangular like this. And so the cell body goes like that. And probably, you know, you have the processes emanating from that cell, and this is the nucleus in there. And that is what we call a pyramidal kind of neuron. This pyramidal kind of neuron is very much typical in the cerebral cortex. So in the cerebral cortex, that is the area where we find more of this, you know, pyramidal kind of cell. And that is why those tracts, you know, the axons of these pyramidal cells as they descend down into the spinal cord, that is why the, you will see them in the test of the column pyramidal tract. Because the axons of these cells, of pyramidal cells, you know, they emanate from this new type, kind of neuron. So that is why those tracts, the corticospinal tracts, which we'll discuss later on, is called pyramidal tract because the cells, where they come from, is pyramidal in shape. Similarly, the, 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 we can have also polygonal kind of neuron. This polygonal neuron is like what I've told you, like all these uh, multipolar kind of neuron is polygonal. That means it has multiple, you know, sides. So polygonal can be seen in the anterior horn cells, you know, and we can also have piriform kind of, you know, this piriform is also 
like a triangle, but it's far different from the pyramid in that uh, the pile of foam, you know, the, the shape is just like a I, it's just like uh, you know, similar to the pyramidal kind of size, and we also have what you call fissiform kind of uh, neurons. The fissiforms, when you hear this word fusiform, it's just like something like a, an ellipsoidal kind of you know shape, but you know it is swollen side by side like this. So this fusiform, fusiform kind of neurons. They are mostly found in the cerebellar hemispheres. So in the cerebellum, we find more of this fissiform kind of neurons, and also the pyriform can also be seen in the, there are also round kind of neurons, whereby you have the cerebral body is round. You know, just like the dorsal root ganglia, you know, the kind of neurons in that the unipolar, uh, they are, the, the cell body is, the, the shape of the cell body is round. And again, the neurons can also be classified based on the synapse they make among themselves. That means if one neuron comes and synapse with another neuron, this is the area we're talking about, the area of fusion, the area of union between neuron A and neuron B. So, if a neuron, now, look at this. This neuron now comes with, this, with a lot of terminal buttons connecting with several neurons here. You get it? This is just one neuron. So this neuron now gives so many inputs to several neurons. That means that neuron now, you know, is what you call a divergent kind of neuron because it diverges information to various neurons. It's just like a broadcasting station. Like in the broadcasting areas, like say television, you know, unit or radio station, they broadcast an information and the whole world will hear. So everybody will hear what that station is saying. The same thing with this kind of neuron. You get it? So it is a divergent kind of neuron. There are those that also receive information from multiple. For example, now this our polygonal kind of neuron with several processes. So one neuron can come here and sign up with this, another neuron, you know, something like that. So, so this is receiving so many information from multiple neurons. That means this guy, this neuron, is receiving, and the other one is given out. Do you see the difference? So this one, as it is receiving, it is convergent kind of neuron because it is receiving a lot of information. And this is similar to our common bus station. If you go to the bus station, like say you want to travel, everybody goes to the station to travel, right? So the station receives everybody before you travel. So the same thing with this multipolar neuron will now receive information from various neurons, and then the information is being transported along. And then, based on the same relationship, there is what we call one-on-one -on -one kind of neuron. That means only one neuron synapsing with another neuron. And that is only seen or peculiar to area where it is very much important. That means an important station. Why is that important station? Eh? Like where? Like in the retina, it's very important. Somebody without eye. In fact, sometimes, some years back, my friend told me that instead of him losing his eyes, he rather loses his penis. I'm telling you, which is true. Because somebody without eyes, you can imagine what kind of trauma that person will have. So, and that is why actually the connection between neurons inside the retina is very important. 
So that area now is an important station. You get my point. So, guys, let us just have a break now. Maybe we'll go and rest and then come back and then we'll continue with another section.